What's good, y'all? Welcome back. Hey, welcome back. Hope you guys are doing good and amazing on this lovely, lovely Saturday. We have the 10 craziest F1 contract stories, but wait, 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 wait. Before we even get to that, shout out to Pierre Gasly. Thank you for resigning. Uh, for stopping, for staying at Red Bull. That's pretty, much, that's pretty much pretty easy. I think we had one more contract extended. I'm not, I forgot who it was, but I think we had one more contract extended. And then, well, and then lastly, Lance Stroll. <laughs> Shout out to Lance Stroll for getting extended with Aston Martin. I'm not really surprised. Now listen, I've said about Lance Stroll, when he's not on some like BS, he can actually have some pretty solid finishes. But when he's on some like, what the hell are you on, bro? It's it's a nasty. It's nasty. But anyway, we are finna get into it. We are finna see these craziest F1 contract stories. We are finna check it out. We are finna see what's on. As always, boys and girls, don't forget to like the video and sub as well as always. I can't wait. Anyway, let's get started. Don't forget to like the video. Details of Formula One contracts are usually shout shrouded in secrecy. As always, shout out to your But race. sometimes scenarios surrounding contracts become so controversial or hilarious that they end up spilling into the public domain. For this video, we've dug out 10 interesting contract stories we think are worth another look. Which stories would make your list? Let us know in the comments. Remember to hit like on this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. 1998 offers. Damon Hill was a man in demand for 1998, holding talks with five teams in the summer of 97. McLaren offered him $1 million per race win but no basic retainer, which Hill took offence to, yeah. while Sauber were offering a million pounds per race, an offer Arrows claimed it would match. Hill then upset Alain Prost by saying his team was too French, and when he told his former teammate he was signing for Jordan, Prost thought it was an underhand tactic to get a higher offer. But Hill's pre The team is too French. Bro, if this is the best team that's gonna, that's gonna win, you are a championship or whatever, bro. I don't give a crap that my American ass decides to sign with a team from like Germany, and I can't speak a lick of German. I'm still gonna sign with them. I'm gonna find. We're gonna find a way to like, communicate. Was always Jordan. I'm gonna still sign Even with, if negotiations uh, for that deal them. were difficult and required some trickery to get the team's title sponsor on his side during the talks. That's crazy though. Edmund Irvine. This story has been attributed to various Ford bigwigs over oh, the Ed years, Irvine. but regardless of who said the famous line, several key members of the Jaguar team, including Irvine, are convinced it's true. During a board meeting at Ford, the salaries of the highest earners in the company were being discussed, when someone asked, who is this Edmund Irvine we're paying millions of dollars to? The story showed the total disconnect between the Ford Motor Company and the F1 team it was That's spending crazy. so much money on. They didn't even know who I was, but I'm on When Nelson Piquet moved from Williams to Lotus for 1988, he was bound to have a much easier time alongside Satoru Nakajima than he had with Nigel Mansell. That's a nasty look. Piquet still had his number one status written into his Lotus contract, and that included Nakajima having to agree to a code of practice that said he was expected to finish behind Piquet, and that no passing manoeuvre will be attempted unless PK had an obvious mechanical problem and was clearly waving him through. And if you're interested, PK's basic salary was $1.5 million a year, with a bonus of $4,000 for every point he scored. I can't pass my teammate. Alright. <laughs> alright, alright. I can't Ferrari pass my teammate somehow. Ferrari initially signed Fernando Alonso for 2011, but when it managed to bring that forward to 2010, it had to move Kimi Raikkonen aside despite the Finn having a contract. Raikkonen held talks with McLaren about a return there for 2010, but those ended when world champion Jensen Button unexpectedly became available. In the end, Raikkonen was paid not to race by Ferrari in 2010, instead taking up rallying for two eventful, incident-packed years before coming back to F1 with Lotus. To make the story even more remarkable, Ferrari then signed him back for 2014. Hmm. My bad, bro. <laughs> Alesi. Jean Alesi had a deal in place to drive for Williams for 1991, but then Nigel Mansell announced he was retiring, leaving Ferrari in need of a replacement. Ooh. When Ferrari approached Alesi, he said he'd already signed for another team. 
However, in private, he was growing concerned about Williams delaying the announcement of their deal, and he eventually decided to sign for Ferrari. Williams managed to convince Mansell out of retirement instead, and it received compensation from Ferrari for Alesi, which included a 1990 car that had been driven by Alain Prost. Williams put the Ferrari on display in its museum before selling it in the early 2000s because it had become too much of a star attraction. That wasn't the only time Ferrari used one of Why its cars it? as a compensation gift. Mansell received one of his 1989 cars in exchange for accepting equal number one status when Alain Prost joined the team. Hmm, that's interesting, Ralph. Jordan's first victory with Damon Hill at Spa was a cause for celebration for everyone except Ralph Schumacher. With a full wet setup, Ralph was clearly faster than Hill, but he was ordered to stay behind to ensure Jordan got a dream 1-2 finish. In the middle of the celebrations, Eddie Jordan was confronted by an angry Michael Schumacher, still fuming from his race-ending collision with David Coulthard that had handed Jordan the win in the first place. The older Schumacher told Jordan that Ralph would not be driving for him in 1999. Michael had already tried to talk Ralph into leaving for Williams, and the Spa situation was the final straw. Jordan had wanted to keep Ralph, but by this stage he knew his head had been turned, so he offered Michael a deal. If he was prepared to buy Ralph out of his contract, then he could leave for Williams. Michael paid up, which Jordan found particularly satisfying given how their previous interaction with each other had gone in 1991. But we'll come back to that one. Maybe I'm missing something, but... Schumacher had all that power to just do that, to buy his own brother's contract with a different team so he can go to it, so Ralph can go to a different team. I'm confused about that. I'm very confused about that. But I'm, I'm going to just keep going. And I'm going to shut the hell up. And I'm going to just keep playing. Three Sauber drivers. signed Marcus Ericsson and Felipe Nazar for 2015, but its 2014 reserve driver Guido Vandergaard arrived in Australia for the first race, claiming he also had a valid contract to drive for the team. Mm. Vandergaard said he'd signed the deal early in 2014 and his sponsors had paid the full amount in advance to help Sauber's finances. When Sauber initially announced Ericsson and Nazar, Vandergaard took the matter to a Swiss tribunal which ruled in his favour. The Australian courts then upheld this decision and Sauber's attempted appeal was dismissed. Vandergaard then backed out of a move to have Sauber's assets seized and agreed not to take the matter any further over the Australian Grand Prix weekend. Sauber reached a settlement with Vandergaard in the days after the race, which the Dutchman said was bizarre as the cash-strapped team had to pay significant compensation to him. Sauber said it had good answers to all the claims made by Vandergaard, but it didn't want to get involved in a mud fight leaving everyone wondering how a team run by a lawyer, Manisha Kaltenborn, had got into such a mess in the first place. Jeez, my God, Lee Sauber. Ugh. Michael Schumacher's F1 debut for Jordan lasted only a few seconds, but after qualifying seventh at Spa, he'd made enough of an impact to instantly find himself at the centre of a contract stall. There are two versions of this story. One is that Schumacher's management cared... What is that? Is that like a... Like a... Like, is he watching film? Is he, you know, going over the race notes? I'm not going to care. That jacket hard, though. That 7-up livery they got going on? Hey, I'm all for it. That bad boy goes crazy. Carefully changed the wording of a letter it sent to Eddie Jordan promising to sign a contract rather than the contract that wow. had been presented to them. This got Schumacher out of a long-term deal That's that was crazy. on the table with Jordan and allowed him to switch to Benetton for That's the next crazy. race at Monza. But Eddie Jordan believes the swap would have happened regardless, and he says it was all the work of Bernie Eccleston, who realised how important it was for F1 in Germany to get Schumacher into a more competitive car. Schumacher's management was also aware that Jordan was switching to the unfancied Yamaha engine for 1992. Talks continued up to the last minute ahead of the Italian Grand Prix, with Jordan eventually helping ousted Benetton driver Roberto Moreno hold out for compensation, then taking most of that cash from the Brazilian to drive in the next two races. The compensation is very like important back then. Like you ain't finna just leave us for free. No. Nah. The Jensen Button yes. Williams BAR contract saga ranks so highly on our list because it went on for so long, and during the course of it, Button changed his mind about which team he wanted to get out of driving for. Button was having the best season of his career with BAR in 2004 when he made the surprising decision to sign for Williams for the following year. 
BAR challenged that deal, claiming a loophole Button was trying to exploit in his existing contract was not valid. Mm. The Contract Recognition Board ruled in BAR's favour, but both Button and Williams said they would work together in the future. Mm. But a year later it became clear Williams was losing its works BMW engines, and this time Button decided he'd be better off staying with BAR. <laughs> Frank Williams was determined to hold him to the deal they'd signed for 2006, but eventually Button was able to pay a significant amount of money to get out of driving for the team he tried so hard to join one year earlier. Button had big, big time, like, PTSD. I don't know, like, when we were compiling this bill? list, Ayrton Senna contract stories kept coming up. In the end, we had so many, we decided that rather than trying to slot them all in as individual entries, we'd just give him the number one slot and rattle <laughs> through as many as we could. So here they are in chronological order. In 1984, Senna was benched for a race by Tolman because it was unhappy about the way he'd gone about engineering a move to Lotus for the following season. At Lotus, Senna vetoed Derek Warwick joining the team for 1986. Senna's view was that Lotus wasn't great at running two cars, so it shouldn't be trying to work for two equal status drivers. Warwick had already signed a contract with Lotus by this point, and while he accepts Senna was probably right, he was disappointed not to get the chance to race alongside him and yeah, their careers went in very different directions after that. That's, that's when Senna switched to McLaren... Hey, I'm, I'm sorry to pause a lot, but that's that's so you kind of like selfish to me, bro. Like, damn, bro, like... You mean trying to team up? You know, we can get some constructors, get some For 1988, together, like... He and Ron Dennis were arguing over half a million dollars in his contract. In the end, they tossed a coin and Dennis won. Because the contract was for three years, half a million dollars became a saving of 1.5 million, much to Ron's delight. At the end of 1989, following the controversial Japanese Grand Prix that handed Alain Prost the title, Senna briefly retired from F1, telling Dennis he wasn't coming back before being persuaded to keep racing. Mm. During 1992, aware that McLaren was falling behind Williams on track, Senna offered to drive for Williams for free. The only problem was that Williams had already signed Prost, and this time Senna was the one being vetoed. <laughs> Senna had serious doubts about driving a Ford-powered McLaren for 1993, only agreeing to race for the team on the eve of the season, initially on a lucrative race-by-race -race deal that often involved him turning up at races at the last minute. Senna continued to push for a drive with Williams for 1994, and as more of the team's partners pressured Frank Williams to sign him, Prost decided to step aside, providing he was paid for the second year of his contract. Mm. The final twist in the tale came ahead of the final race of 1993, which Senna would go on to win for McLaren. Senna was having doubts about leaving, and he told Ron Dennis that if he'd known sooner that McLaren would have works Peugeot engines for 1994, he would have been prepared to stay. Mm. That's our list of crazy F1 contract stories. I, I'll say this, the cinema was interesting because, like, he kind of got vetoed. <laughs> that's that's kind of crazy, but... It seemed like a lot of these drivers had deals in plan with other teams, but the teams they were originally with, like, no, nah, we're not going for that. Like, they were telling Kimmy to stay home, Damon Hill, like, what? Michael Schumacher, Ralph getting paid off by his brother, like, they were all insane. So that's why I was like, I feel like I didn't know a lot of these drivers had, like, this much power in terms of, like, what they can, like, control, like, who they want, who, who, who they want to, like, bring in. Y'all let, let me know in the comments down below. Shout out to the race as always. Hope you guys like the video. Sub as well. I'll see you guys again. Peace.